So last week we started a new sermon series here at the church talking about prayer. And you gave the name The Secret Room to this series. To this series. The name, the title of this sermon series comes from this passage in Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus says that we should not be like the hypocrites because they, they love to pray in a public space, in the synagogues, in the corner, at the streets. And Jesus says that we should, <clears throat> when we pray, you should go to our room, shut the, do shut the door, and pray to our Father who is in secret. So, this is where we find the, the title for this sermon series, The Secret Room, The Prayer Room. Last week, we introduced this series talking about some attitudes when we enter the secret room. This was the title of the first message, Entering the Secret Room. And we talked about sincerity. We should be honest, no masks in this room. We should uh, have submission because we should be open to be transformed when we are there in this prayer room. And we talked about expectancy because the text says that God will reward us. And we said that the reward is not necessarily the things that we ask, but God himself. And today we will continue the text. Last week we read... Uh, chapter 6, verses uh, 5 and 6, and now we read 7 and 8. Last week, Jesus talked about the hypocrites, and now he will talk about the Gentiles. Let's see what Jesus is saying here, verse 7. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. It's interesting that Jesus is saying here that the Gentiles those who didn't have access to the revelation, to the scriptures, they also pray. People that are not part of the God's community in the Bible, they pray. We understand that there is a human instinct for prayer. You find people praying in many different religions. Prayer, we can say, is not a kind of exclusive Christian practice. In every religion, we see people praying. And more than that, I was reading this week that about, uh, th there, is, uh, there are two surveys saying that nearly 30% of atheists, they prayed sometimes. Even atheists pray. 17% of non-believers in God pray regularly. So you see that the act of prayer doesn't validate the content of your prayer. The Gentiles also pray. And Jesus here is doing a contrast between this prayer and the Christian prayer. He is talking about the Gentiles. Some versions says the pagans or the heaven and the disciples. What's the difference? What Jesus is talking here, what Jesus is like, what, what is he 
teaching here about prayer, considering how the Gentiles pray. Because he will say, do not be like them. Do not pray like them. So, first of all, let's see how the Gentiles pray. What Jesus is saying here. He starts saying, they think that they will be heard for their many words. Let's understand what Jesus is saying here. The Gentiles, and we are talking here about the Gentiles during Jesus' time. We can think about the Greeks, about the Romans, people that uh, Jesus knew very well in his time. And these Gentiles, they had many different gods. Many gods. And they believed that these gods, they were distant. They had their affairs in heaven. They were not uh, concerned about our lives here. Although sometimes they could be very uh, harsh to humans. And they could be impressed. So the Gentiles, they believe that if we want to be blessed by the gods, we need to get his or her attention, first of all. We need to get God's attention. This is what they believed. We need to impress them. It's a kind of... Cosmic X Factor. I don't know if you watched this show on TV, right? You have people doing like amazing, incredible things, and we have uh, there some judges. And the judges, they started usually like that. Oh, let's see if this guy can impress me. Sometimes they say, impress me. And people do like crazy things to impress the judges. What Jesus is saying is that the Gentiles, they were like believing that prayer is like a show. And we need to impress, we need to get God's attention. And for that, we should use many words. We should have a good... Uh, Vocabulary. But Jesus is calling here, and this is a very difficult word to be translated, because we have ESV talking about empty phrases. And we have NIV talking about bubbling. We have New King James Version saying vain repetitions. Nazb says thoughtless repetition. There are different translations to what Jesus is saying here. But the idea is that this kind of, these Gentiles, they believed that they should enter into a kind of emotional trance to connect with the divine. So they repeated words very, very often. They believed that prayer is a magic is a kind of transaction that liberates a secret power. Have you heard this expression, prayer is the lever that moves God's hands? So they believed like that. They believed that when we pray, when we repeat things very uh, often, then we can impress, we can enter. When we are very uh, moved by our own prayer, we believe that God will be moved. Their focus was on the aesthetic aspects of prayer. I'll give you another example. I like, like graphic design. I have some kind of uh, 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 affection for that. I, I like to see things well done, you know, in a graphic aspect. And I discovered that today we have this kind of tool called Lauren Ibsen. Do you know what's Lauren Ibsen? I don't know if you know that, but maybe if you work with uh, computers, you know that. This is uh, the placeholder text used in design when creating content. 
It helps designers plan out where the content will sit without needing to wait for the content to be written and approved. So they have like the right design, the format, but the content doesn't make any sense. This is just like words. They are there just to see how the final aspect will be. Laying out pages with meaningless uh, filler text can be very useful when the focus is meant to be on design, not content. I would say here that there is a kind of Lauren Ipsum prayer. This is the one that wants to impress by its layout, external factors, intensity, volume, emotional, physical uh, aspect, the words you, you can use. So Jesus is saying, hey, do not do that. There is something missing there. The content is important. There is a, an example of this kind of prayer in the Bible. The book of Joel, the prophet Joel in the Old Testament. You know that in the Old Testament, when you were repented, when you felt the burden of sin in your life, you usually had a kind of exterior sign. You tear your uh, garments, right? Your clothes. And then it was uh, a time when the people knew that when the prophet says, hey, repent, the way that we can respond to the prophet, to God's word, is just tearing the clothes. Then Joel comes and see what he says. That is why the Lord says, Joel 2, 12 and 13, turn to me now while there is time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping and mourning, but don't tear your clothing in your grief, but tear your hearts instead. See that it's possible to keep the ritual while losing the meaning. It's possible to keep the design, the layout. Oh, it's prayer. But you lose, you lose the, 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 the meaning of what you were saying. Jesus is talking about this kind of prayer with empty phrases or babbling blah, 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 or vain repetitions, thoughtless repetition. He's talking about this kind of mantra. What Jesus is saying here is that prayer is not a magic formula to get the attention of a cosmic impersonal power. If when first Jesus talked about the Pharisees, and what he was saying was that, don't try to impress others with your prayer. But now Jesus is talking about the Gentiles that didn't know God. And he is saying, don't try to impress God with your prayers. He says, do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. The Gentiles thought that they needed to impress God. They thought in some way that they could control God's reaction. They could move God's hands. They could impress God. In the first lesson, when we read what Jesus is saying here, do not be like them. And this is our message today. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Let's understand what Jesus is saying here in teaching us today about prayer. Two things we have here and uh, an implication of that. First, 
Jesus is saying that we don't need to get God's attention. You don't need to get God's attention. Why? Because he knows. He already knows. You don't need to get his attention because you think that he is distant and he is not aware of what is happening. No, the text says that, Jesus, that God is very aware. That God is paying attention. God sees. And when the Bible uses this word knows, it's more than just knowing about. The word uses... The, 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 the Bible uses the, the word knows in a very intimate way. God, when Jesus is saying that God knows, Jesus is saying God cares. There is this question. If God knows what I need, why should I pray? Have you heard that question? If God knows, and people say, oh, the Bible is saying, Jesus is saying, God knows what we need. So why should we pray if he already knows? When we ask that question, we are starting with a wrong assumption. And this assumption is that the goal of prayer is to inform or convince God about our cause. And if this is the case, I agree, there is no sense in praying. However, Jesus is saying that God knows, not in the sense that God just knows the facts, no. Some scholars, they say that Jesus is not just pointing to God's omniscience here, but to God's love, to God's care. He cares about the, the primary purpose of prayer is not to get something, but to know someone. So think about that. I have a wife. Forgive me for using her many times as examples, uh, illustration here, but I need to say that. Sometimes your wife will come to you to talk, right? You are a husband here. You have a wife. And sometimes, if you are like me, when you hear your wife talking, the first reply, natural reply is, okay, how can we fix this? I remember once that Juliana came to me talking about a problem in the workplace. And she was very upset with the situation. And he talked, and, he and she talked, talked, talked. And then after that, I asked, OK, what do what you want? You don't understand me. <laughs> I'm not talking about fixing a problem. I'm just talking. <laughs> OK, it was not in that tune, right? But OK, you understand what I'm trying to say is that Yes, sorry about that. But what I'm trying to say, it seems that today we need to talk <laughs> later, okay? But let, let me explain this. Sometimes we talk, we should talk, not necessarily to fix something, to solve a problem. We talk to have intimacy, to know better each other to have the assurance that the other cares. And then we talk. I would say that the fact that God knows doesn't make our prayer unnecessary. On the contrary, it makes it possible because we know that God knows. So we can pray with confidence that we are not praying to a wall. We are not just having a kind of trance and talking about just to put outside what we have inside. No. We pray because we have this assurance that God knows. Mm -hmm.
that he will hear, that he is listening to, and he cares about what we are saying. So what Jesus is saying here, we don't need to get God's attention. You can pray, you should pray with confidence. You pray like your daughter talked to you, your son talked to you, talks to you. This is the first thing we learn here. We don't need to get God's attention, for your father knows. But also, there is a second element, not so evident. Our prayer is never, never the first word or the first move. Why? Because Jesus says that your father knows before. Think about that. Your father, our father knows not when you talk to him. Then you talk to him and then he knows. No, he knows before. Which means that when you pray, this is not the first word. Then this is not the first move. You are not starting nothing, any, anything. God already knows before. And this talks about uh, communication and language. Think about that. How do we learn how to speak? Think about that. How you learn to speak? When you are a child, since birth, we are exposed to sounds that at the beginning don't make sense, okay? And then at some point, we start saying words, mama, papa, Bottle, blanket, there are many words, ball. At the beginning, when you talk, you don't know what you are saying. You are repeating, but language is entering your mind. It's interesting that you can speak in the same way that you are spoken. You learn how to speak by learning to listen to. There is this quote from Eugene Peterson, and he says, language is spoken into us. We learn language only as we are spoken to. All speech is answering speech. We were all spoken to before, to before we spoke. What is essential in prayer is not that we learn to express ourselves, but that we learn to answering God. As we learn God, as we learn what he has revealed to us in the scripture, we learn to pray, we learn to talk to him. So this brings an implication to us, a huge implication. What's the implication of these two facts that we don't need to get God's attention and that our prayer is, not, is never the first word or the first move? What's the implication? The implication is that the more we know the Father, the better we pray to the Father. The problem with the Gentiles, Jesus is saying, was that they didn't know God. They didn't know the revelation, the scriptures. They didn't have a heavenly Father that is at the same time a Father that is near us. So there is nothing like a kind of this X factor, a cosmic X factor. You don't need to impress God because you know God. You don't need to impress your father. My daughters 
They don't need to impress me to be loved. They don't need to impress me so I can help, help them. Then I can have a conversation with them. No, because they are my daughters. But at the same time, as they grow and as they learn about me, we can communicate better. And we come to a point where we know so well each other that before, even before, see the, the word before again, even before we speak anything, they already know, hey daddy, is something wrong today? Have you had this experience to come for breakfast? And before you say anything, your wife comes to you and says, what's wrong? Hey, I didn't say nothing. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm no, I know. I see you. So when we have intimacy, when we have this kind of relationship, when we know each other for a long time, when we are partners in this long journey, then sometimes we don't even to say anything. The more we know the Father, the better we pray to the Father. Tim Keller says, you cannot grow in relationship with a person unless you learn who he or she is. The nature of the prayer is determined by the character of God, who is at once our friend, our father, lover, shepherd, and king. We pray in response to God himself. So when, when something moves you to pray, God already knows. It's not the case that you are moving God. No, it's the opposite. God is moving you. And when something happens in your life, you don't need to come to God and just, God, you don't know what happened. No, he already knows. And the Bible says that he is in control of everything. So your prayer is not the first move. Your prayer is the way that you will react, that you will answer what's happening in your life based on your Knowledge of God. Pray with the Bible. I would say pray the Bible. Because without the Bible, our own perceived needs become the drivers and focus of our prayers. And this is very, very dangerous. Because there is a time when you can mistake God told me something. I was praying, and then I have this assurance that God is talking to me. And without immersion in God's word, if God's word doesn't dwell richly in your heart, what happens is that you can be hearing not God, but your wishes, yourself. You can be self-deceived by your feelings. It's not your feelings that should drive your prayer. It's God's word. And I will give you one example to finish. Uh, in this book about prayer that we just quoted here, Tim Keller talks about this uh, story with George Whitfield. George Whitfield was one of the greatest preachers ever. He was part of this great awakening in the 18th century, century and uh, he was a preacher. He was a man of God. And at some point, he and his wife, Elizabeth, they got a child. And when this child was born, George Whitfield had a strong feeling, a strong assurance that this baby would be a great preacher, 
that God would use this baby to bring salvation to many, many, many people. And then he, George Whitfield was an Anglican minister, clergyman, and he baptized his son and he gave the name of John in reference to John the Baptist. His wife was Elizabeth, so following the pattern in the Bible, the son of Elizabeth, John, John the Baptist. So he said, this is John the Baptist. And he preached a sermon that day talking how God had talked to him and gave, and God had given him the assurance that this boy would be a great preacher of the word. The problem was that when John Whitfield was four months old, he had a seizure and he died. And you imagine George Whitfield and his wife, of course, they were devastated. But more than that, see what Tim Keller says uh, in conclusion of this story. George was particularly convicted about how wrong he had been to count his inward impulses and intuitions as being essentially equal to God's word. He realized he had led his congregation into the same disillusioning, disillusioning mistake. Whitfield had interpreted his own feelings his understandable and powerful fatherly pride and joy in his son and his hopes for him as God is speaking to his heart. Not long afterward, he wrote a ranching prayer for himself that God would render this mistaken parent more cautious, more sober-minded, more experienced in Satan's devices, and consequently more useful in his future labors to the church of God. The lesson here is not that God never guides our thoughts or prompts us to choose wise courses of action, but that we cannot be sure he is speaking to us unless we read it in the scripture. The scripture is the solid ground for prayer. If you want to pray better, read the scripture. If you want to pray uh, with uh, all your mind and heart, if you want to really Communicate with God. Pray with the scripture. Pray the scripture. Because this is God speaking to us. We are children. And then we, at the beginning, we, we read the scripture and we are not so familiar. And then, oh, I don't understand this word. What, what, what does it mean, mama? What, what's mama? I don't know. But then you are reading, and you grow, and you learn God's language in here. So the lesson, the implication, and this is just one thing that I want to say to you today. The more we know the Father, the better we pray to the Father. It's our knowledge of who God is that drives how we pray in the types of things we pray about. All of us, we should be moved by God's word. Let's read the Bible. If you want to grow in prayer, read the Bible. If you don't know the Bible, if you don't read the Bible, if you don't have familiarity with the Bible, then you, you are praying. Yeah, you are praying. But maybe you are praying like the Gentiles. They don't know God. They are trying to impress God. But when you read the Bible, you know that your father knows before 
what you need. This is a challenge for you. Prayer is not just self-expression. Prayer is not just, and I would say, prayer starts there with honesty, with sincerity, sincerity. But prayer goes beyond that. I would love to see my, my daughters coming to me, and it's beautiful when they are one year old and they start speaking. And they say, Mama, Papa. But I would be very, very concerned, even disappointed, if Gabriella today, 22 years old, came to me, oh, Papa, Mama. If, if she doesn't know how to say more than these two words, I would be concerned about that. There's a problem. I would say, Gabriela, you need to grow. If you are not growing, there's a problem. You don't know me after 22 years? You don't know how it, my will? When Jesus teaches prayer, right after this passage, we have Lord, the Lord's Prayer. And when Jesus starts praying, what Jesus is saying, how Jesus starts, Jesus starts talking about first God's kingdom, God's name, and God's will. He's not talking about himself. He's talking about God. Because he is saying, hey, I know you, God. You are my father. I know your name. I know your kingdom. I know your will. So let's pray like Jesus. Let's grow and let's pray in the name of Jesus. Let me pray and then we finish. And I hope that this challenge goes with us this week so we can pray with confidence that God is listening to our prayers. But at the same time, we are based in our prayer in the scripture, not in our uh, feelings or impressions.